And uh, I'm going to introduce you first to our moderator, who's going to take, take the reins from here. And he is Brian Sergitz, who is the president of CauseCast, which you can find on causecast.org. And I will let Brian tell you a little bit more about what CauseCast is and, and introduce the rest of the panel. So thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Um, first of all, thank everybody for, thank you all for coming today. Um, and it's sort of been a, been a long day, and it's uh, and the pool and the drinks by the pool look very uh, tempting at this point. But, you know, all of us are on this panel today because there's uh, something that calls us to work in in a field where there's uh, the ability to inspire others and to give something within each of us to ourselves. And, I, you know, again, you know, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody here, and I think I'm going to let them do that. But the, I think there's something happening here with, you know, with how media is, being, uh, is evolving at a very rapid pace and how individually we are no longer confined to... Um, specific types of ways of interacting with that media and it's coming in all different forms and there's a lot of it and there's a lot of messages that are out there and there's also a lot of noise that's out there as well so what I'd like to get into today is I'm going to I'm going to introduce everybody here and 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 it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm very I'm humbled by the, the people that are on this panel everyone here has done and is continuing to do amazing things in terms of how they inspire other people how they continue to give up themselves in order to keep people inspired, um, and really how you know um, as as we go forward, the the root the, the, the goal that I'd like to get out of this is not only as we have a conversation, is how how media based on whatever scale, large or small, how it can really make a difference, and I think that's why we're 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 all here. So. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to uh, go down the line. Obviously, this is, uh, if you guys can see the, uh, the makeshift uh, <laughs> uh, name tags. Uh, sitting on my left is Juan Davis. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Um, I'll let Juan, why don't you talk a little bit about who I am. Unless you want me to do it for you. Um, um, yeah, you know, I'm a guy from Colombia that came here maybe, what, 20 years ago? Uh, and now I'm the director of production at KCT, which is our local PBS station, director of production of media, which is our local PBS station, and we're trying to connect and work with uh, the community, you know, producing um, online content. Um, I'm Mark Morgan Stern. I'm the executive director of Declare Yourself. Uh, Declare Yourself does a few things. We um, focused for the last two years on voter registration for young people and registered more than uh, 2 million people in the last couple of years. Now we're focused on con continuing to keep those young people involved in what goes on in this country. We also have the wonderful job of touring a copy of the Declaration of Independence uh, printed the night of July 4th, 1776, which we hope inspires people not only to vote but to uh, become true, active, and thoughtful citizens. My name is Robert Behar. I'm the producer and writer of a documentary film called Made in L.A. And uh, this was a film that started here in Los Angeles as a grassroots project. The initial idea for the film was uh, to make a short educational video. And over five and a half years, it evolved into a feature-length documentary. Uh, the film ended up airing on PBS's POV series. And uh, luckily, the film ended up winning an Emmy. And uh, a lot has happened around the film. Over the last two years, we've been really continuously involved in a social action campaign around the film. So um, you know, through that process, I've become really focused on how films intersect with social movements. And because this is a film about workers in Los Angeles, about issues of immigration, um, immigration reform is becoming a really important issue, once again, on the national agenda. So we're doing a lot of work right now, even as we speak. There are over 100 screenings being planned around the country of the film that are using it to deal with these issues. So I can address that. Hi, my name is Melissa Fitzgerald, and I'm an actor. And I went as a volunteer to do some humanitarian work in northern Uganda several years ago. And um, 
really was taken with the problem there and, and saw how relatively cheap and easy it would be to end that war and thought that the best way for me to um, work towards that goal uh, would be to make a documentary. And so I got some of my friends to come with me to the war zone in northern Uganda and we did a theater program with 14 teenagers displaced um, by the war. And we're producing it, we're almost finished, um, but immediately after we came back, we cut three short form pieces so that we could begin implementing an advocacy campaign immediately, because we didn't want to wait uh, till the film was finished. For some reason, I wanted to say my name was Elvis, but it's not. It's uh, <laughs> you, such an opportunity to introduce yourself to someone. So uh, my name is Charlie Annenberg. I'm a trustee at the Annenberg Foundation. Um, I was invited here to speak. I've uh, created or I'm the founder of a multimedia project called Explore. And in a nutshell, the mission of Explore is to champion the selfless acts of others. It's basically a, a library of photographs and videos of people doing good work around the world. Hi, I'm Nikki Fremel. Um, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. Uh, I have um, a website called Wikipedia.com. Um, bunch of followers on Twitter, I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> I worked in this space a lot previously. I used to work at Participant Productions. We did An Inconvenient Truth and a bunch of other films you may have heard of. Um, and I, I sort of launched and ran their interactive department for a while. Uh, but I left there a couple years ago. Our mission was, was similar to, to what other people here are doing, which is you know to create films to affect social change. And then my job then was to create an actual online social action campaign where people could really get involved and get their hands dirty and you know, say what they think about the issues and that sort of thing. Um, so I left there because I actually became more interested in the infrastructure that was enabling that kind of activism. I got more interested in the technology, the sort of startup side of things. So I left there and went to work at uh, Rever, which was sort of a, um, they're still around, sort of, but a, a competitor to YouTube. Um, and then I left there and have since been consulting and primarily for, for projects that are trying to, to build sustainable online communities, um, helping with that. And then I have a couple startups of my own right now that um, I can't really talk about yet. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So. Well, thank you, everybody. I, 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 I felt by uh, you guys introducing each you know, of yourselves individually and what you do is uh, do it more justice. And what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, go down the line. We're, uh, people are going to either show something present something, we're going to talk a little bit about it, um, and, we're, and then what we're going to do after we get through um, either showing, showing a clip, uh, individually we'll talk about it for five minutes, and then we're going to go uh, to ask questions to the, to the room. So we'll start with Juan, why don't you talk about a little bit more about that. Well, uh, I, can we... I did a little, we cannot be like live on the, on, on the web right now, so what I did was a, a video capture of one of the projects that we are working on at KCT Media, uh, which is called Departures. Um, oops. It's, uh, yeah, but it's... Uh, What's what? Um, it, Apple is zero. Outsourcing. Anyway, um, there we go. So uh, Departures uh, was uh, our, our, our attempt at the beginning uh, to make a series, a very hyper-local series about neighborhoods here in Los Angeles. Um, and the idea that here in LA there's uh, you know, little uh, to walk to see, little community interaction, everybody's in their car, and uh, nobody really has sort of a social tissue that they can sort of gravitate together to. Um, so we decided to make a series about different neighborhoods in LA, but with a small twist, concentrate on, concentrate on one street in that neighborhood and see what would happen in that street. So, by concentrating on the street, we created sort of a, this uh, idea of an online documentary where you take, let's say, Sunset Boulevard from uh, point A to point B and see what happens and see who lives there and uh, what are sort of the, the, you know, the people, the stories, the history, the culture of the people that live there. Um, 
And we began this sort of like an offshoot back in 2007, I think. And since then, we have produced uh, uh, a series of them, uh, one in Watts in Central Avenue. And you, as you can see here, um, the main navigation of the street is sort of this panorama that is um, um, inspired by the muralist tradition that uh, was very much part of the history of Los Angeles in Boyle Heights, in, um, in South Central LA and other areas. And this panorama is sort of laden with hotspots of the people and places that live there. Uh, and uh, you can get to see, you get video portraits of uh, uh, the local players, you get to hear their stories. Um, and one of the, the, the things that we wanted to do was sort of to mix this mundane sort of uh, daily life of the people in the neighborhood to the history, uh, to the geography, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to show almost like uh, the, you know, a normal person that, you know, lives there, works there, is as astute as any academic. Um, uh, here, for example, there's Casa 101 in Ball Heights where there's a community theater over there, and um, you know they put plays done and produced by the community, um, and um, you see the policemen that live there. Uh, so the series expanded to Watts in Central Avenue, but one of the things that we decided to do was that this was a great opportunity uh, for us not to go to the community and actually to you know, to record this, but to figure out ways of getting the community involved in helping us produce this thing. Uh, not only in terms of the production of it, but also in terms of the content. And right now we're mapping the 52 miles of the LA River, and we're working with the Friends of the LA River, uh, helping us develop the content. And we're also helping with, uh, working with uh, a charter school in Lincoln Heights, which is adjacent to the river. Uh, to produce this interactive online documentary about the river. And, um, you know, I don't know if you guys saw, there was a little fish there, proof that there's life <laughs> in the river. Um, and the final thing that we're gonna do is all the assets that we collect from uh, this sort of experience uh, are going to be given to uh, the users online so that they can actually create or remix their own interpretation of, uh, of the neighborhood, of the street, and actually be able to upload uh, images of their own that you know tell the story of this neighborhood. Those are the three minutes that I had, uh, and maybe later on we can you know talk a little further about it. What what inspired you to make to do this project? Like, I mean, what was the? I mean, where where was your off, like sort of that Oprah aha moment? The that, aha <laughs> moment. Uh, you, you know, I think the aha moment is that when you take your time to walk down a neighborhood and talk to the people in the neighborhood, uh, you can get lost there. I mean, being extremely local, it's almost like if you're taking a journey to the other side of the world. And you don't need to take a plane to find adventure. And you don't need to take your car to, um, you know, to go to the other side of the world. It's right in the city. Uh, that we live in, and I think that that was sort of what, what I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, explore different sort of ideas that have been part of LA history, muralism, uh, figure out how the sort of all these interactive tools can help, you know, sort of extend uh, what muralism once meant, um, you know, to this sort of world of online media. Um, and also to you know, to sort of, uh, uh, sort of present a way of uh, how do we learn how to walk again on the streets, you know, in the neighborhood. Anyway, thank you. That's wonderful stuff. Uh, we are Declare Yourself, and we make no apology, like, apologies for sizzle. Uh, sort of a very basic philosophy we have is that if you can't get someone's attention, you cannot get them to take action. So we use mass media, we use celebrity, we use on and offline uh, in a big way to accomplish that. So what I'd like to do is, is play a quick reel that sort of gives you a summary of some of the things we've done over the past couple of years. 
it's a bit of a montage, but you'll you'll uh, get a real taste of uh, what we're talking about. Hopefully. Uh, well, I'll just keep talking while we're waiting for that to come up because keep talking. That, yeah, that should be it. And. Yeah, these are some of our um, print ads. You can see if you advance that. We have a, a slogan that we've used for four years called Only You Can Silence Yourself. And you can see under 2,000 and some unnamed uh, people here. And the idea is very graphically and very dramatically, uh, we were able to get over 100 million print impressions in the past year. As you can see, it's pretty graphic stuff, and it all plays out with a meaningful uh, theme of if you don't speak out, if you don't vote, if you don't act, you're silencing yourself. And that's Jessica Alba, who was um, our spokesperson this past year. There should be a, what's called a super wheel on there somewhere. There should be a button. Yeah, there's another button. Oh, there it is. Do you want to double-click that and it has audio? Uh, so if we can pot up the audio there, we can see our sort of summary. documents in our nation's history. There are only 25 in existence. A couple goes to an estate sale. They buy a picture, basically, because they like the frame. They take the picture out, and what's back there, this original copy of the Declaration. It's our nation's birth certificate, and it belongs to everybody, and that's why it must travel. The goal is to bring the people's document directly to the people, especially young people, to inspire them, above all, to vote. some of the people we work with and, and uh, some of the media, big media, we use to move the needle. And as I said, over the past uh, four years, we've registered more than four million people. <laughs> now, we all have a challenge now. We use this wonderful celebrity media machine 
and it is a machine. It's like it has a voracious appetite, uh, and but guided in the right direction, it could be a great force for good, as you saw here. It, it was very effective in, in helping us accomplish our goals. So you saw there 2009. What about 2009? I think all of us up here face a challenge that I hope we talk about a little bit, that how do we keep particularly the young people who were engaged by the last election, particularly engaged by the candidacy of Barack Obama, how do we keep them activated? How do we keep them um, working for the various causes here and so many others that you, you see on Brian's site and, el and elsewhere? Uh, that's a challenge we all face, and particularly in these tough economic times. So I uh, hope we can get to that topic today. Um, what, what, what really in, uh, in, in, was uh, unique about the, the messaging there was that you did have, a, you know, there is that celebrity component, and there is that broadcasting of, the, of, the, of, the, of this medium of where people are affected by that. Does declare yourself uh, like Juan allow or going to allow uh, people to start to interact more so as well to have a voice to you? Sure. Uh, so it's more of a two-way street in terms of them feeling a part of the conversation because I think a part of what, where this is going to go is with all of us here is how does we, how do, as media expands and people start to consume it differently, how do they become involved? Sure, I think that's a, a great question. And, and when you use a lot of mass media, particularly traditional media like television and print as we did, it can be very much of a one-way street. And we recognize that. So a few things that we're doing to accomplish that. We have a site called uh, remixamerica.org, which is a mashup site, and actually it's run by Erica Johansson, who's sitting back there, who's the producer of the site, with wonderful in-browser editing tools where we create these challenges for people to, to and materials for them to remix and, and mash up and react to what's, what's going on. We also have created another site more recently called bornagainamerican.org, which features a music video sort of shot at iconic locations around the country that's been seen by more than 7 million Americans, many of them older than the young people you saw there, uh, as a call to action with a pledge that people can sign and uh, actually see their name on, uh, under a copy of the Declaration of Independence. But most importantly, to uh, get to your question, Brian, where they can submit uh, comments, questions, uh, we've asked, uh, for example, for people to tell us how is the economic crisis affecting them at home? What is it, how is it hitting their lives? And we've gotten literally thousands of comments. So the two-way street is really important and traditional and less traditional media. I don't want to say online is non-traditional because um, it's not. It uh, has traditions by now. But interactivity is critically important. <laughs> Robert? So um, we've done a lot of different things around Made in LA, but I'll just focus on one of them right now. We actually had two clips, but we'll only show one, I think, in the interest of time. And the one that we'll show is the one that's labeled immigration. But I'll get to that in just a sec. Um, but so after the film had been broadcast, it was having a life. We were touring with the film, going to universities around the country and showing it. And we knew that we wanted to do a concerted campaign because we knew that there was a particular opportunity coming up. This is a film that deals with stories of immigration, deals with stories of workers and workers' struggles and what it means to be an immigrant worker in this country. And we knew that this was a film that because it really personalized these issues, there's no narration, it just very personally brings you into the lives of three women, that this film had a power to move people and to stir them to action and to put them for 70 minutes in you know, someone else's shoes. So following the election this year, as we started to see that the stars were kind of lining up and a number of uh, organizations inside the Beltway, a number of organizations on the grassroots side were planning to uh, work towards an attempt at immigration reform again this year, we saw that there was an opportunity where the film could be a tool unlike all the other tools that they had, because of course there are big infrastructures and a lot of resources being uh, you know, put towards this issue. But no one had this. No one had something like this where five and a half years of energy had gone into it. So we thought that how can we do this campaign? And what we decided to do was to create a tool set 
so that anyone anywhere in the country could hold their own screening of the film and to create some short videos based on the film that um, encapsulate certain messages. So in 70 minutes, there are many, many different themes in the film. There's much covered. But here, to just you know, zoom in and just focus on something particular with that messaging fit what a lot of bloggers were trying to cover, what a lot of these organizations were trying to do. So um, that, in essence, was the idea of the campaign. I can talk a little bit more about it, but why don't we take a look at the clip and then I can just sketch out a little bit more. You know, that's the trailer. It's actually the other clip, which has the name Immigration in the title. <laughs> which one? Uh, it, is, it is a PAL format, but as a quick time, you know, quick time should just play it with no problem. So as we're waiting for that, you know, I, I can keep going. I know we have web access here, but if we do, we do not, because it's also available online. No, there's, a, there's what I've been told is that we do not have internet access. Okay, we do not have internet access. Okay. And that's why this hotel sponsored the digital Hollywood Digital Hollywood conference. <laughs> exactly. You can try, you can, you can, you have a little device maybe, you can bring it up. <laughs> and just say, unfortunately, it's not up here. <laughs> um, but, well, yeah, that's it. So we'll see if it plays. Um, but, but in the meanwhile, I can just describe the tool set a little bit that we developed. Was a whole page that walked groups through everything they needed to do screenings. Because when you think about how are you going to ask people to take some kind of action in their communities, well, a lot of the people that we're trying to reach with a campaign like this are not people who necessarily are online and not necessarily going to be moved just by something that happens online. So a lot of what we've been doing has been reaching out to large networks. For example, there's uh, the interfaith. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> no, it's just a DV file. Are you playing off the off the CD? Do you want to try copying it to the hard drive? Okay. So let's just talk about because we can always come back to it. Okay, so we can always come back to it. Yeah, let's let's um, we can talk a little bit about more of the tool set, and then we'll continue. Of course. On, and then we'll yeah, we'll, we'll get into discussion. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> so essentially, what we did was reach out to networks. For example, the Interfaith Immigration Coalition, America's Voice, Center for Community Change and work with those groups around the idea of hosting local screenings of the film. And again, a lot of these groups, they each have slightly different positions around what immigration reform should look like. So we created a discussion guide with a uh, sort of focused discussion you can have after screening the film, and then ways that they can customize the action. So we suggest certain actions, but to keep a slightly bigger tent, we give them options for you know, what page they can send people to in terms of, you know, here's the messaging we want you to use when you reach out to your congressperson, for example. Um, so this has been really, uh, you know, this has really been um, adopted fairly widely. Right now, there are a lot of very large faith communities that are looking at using this as a program, both right now and into the summer. And um, you know, the first of April, we had a congressional screening um, you know, on Capitol Hill where several Congress members spoke. And again, we had faith communities there. We had the grassroots side represented you know, to look at the film as a way to bring those issues also to Congress members. So if you have the clip right now, maybe we should pass the baton and come back. OK. Um. One, one quick question. Yes. Where do, where do you, I mean, when you're talking about where pe people uh, don't have the ability to access like, even online, how would they actually know to obviously uh, to, to be able to get these kits, for example? So if so, we're out here, we're talking about tools, we're talking about online tools. How did that actually apply to things that were offline like you're talking about, and how would people know about that? What did you do that didn't, did not use the internet to... Uh, to, to get people to know, be aware, and to, to for them to be inspired, to exactly. want it, to want to get that kit. Right, right. So a lot of what we did was, as we started to get to know 
all the groups that were doing this kind of organizing, it's really about going to your audience and figuring out what is the appropriate organizing strategy for that audience. So for example, a lot of the faith communities that are really focused around organizing work, there are conference calls every month with about 200 or more people on that conference call. So just yesterday, as an example, we did a whole presentation on one of these conference calls. We had a flyer that you know, was emailed around to everyone who was on that conference call. On the call, we were careful to give the phone number of our office for groups that didn't know how to order the kit or didn't have access to that site. So that's really what it was. It was embracing the tools that those groups were using. Great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Melissa Fitzgerald, um, welcome. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Um, I, um, you know, had mentioned before that um, I went to Northern Uganda with a group of actors to do a theater program and to document the whole process in order to bring that back to, to the United States and develop an advocacy campaign around it, which we've already started doing, even though the film's not quite finished. Um, and the other thing that we did in order to make sure that the advocacy campaign actually did happen and, and rather than recreating the wheel, um, we partnered with International Rescue Committee and the International Medical Corps um, in order to do several things. One, to help us on the ground when we were there and to guide us because we were going into a war zone with a bunch of actors and the film crew. And, um, and then also for them to really implement an advocacy campaign around the issue, and, and they're so involved in that already, we just thought, why not go to the people who do it well? And we're still working with more organizations like Resolve Uganda, Enough Project, um, and it's been very helpful to have a video for many reasons. We presented at different events, and we have used the video clips Plus, um, we had three monologues written by professional writers um, based on interviews we conducted in the field, and we have known actors perform those, like Allison Janney and, and Martin Sheen and, and, and different actors. And that really helps get an audience. And I think it was what you were saying a moment ago, if, if we can't get them in the room, and we can't, they're not going to hear our message. And that's been very helpful in, in getting people's attention. Um, I do have a little clip. It's on a DVD. Um, but before I even do that, you were saying the aha moment. Yes. Um, my aha moment was the first year that I went to northern Uganda in 2006, and I was working with malnourished children and their mothers in internally displaced persons camps where approximately 1,000 people a week were dying. And nobody knew about it in this country. Like, I didn't really know much about it before I went. Most of my friends didn't know. And um, a man came up to us as we were leaving one of the camps and said, please don't let us die in this horrible place. Please tell the people in America what is happening to us here. And, you know, it took a little while. I went back to the United States after that and spoke to my friends, and, and we kind of decided, well, what do we do well? Well, we act and we write and we can make movies, so let's do that. Um, and everybody who went except for sort of our, our sound people and our DPs were volunteers. Um, and we decided to invest in a great sound guy <laughs> and two wonderful DPs because we thought that would be money well spent for our movie, and it was. Um, and it was a really grassroots project. We've had about, I don't know, eight or ten fundraisers over the past two years. We don't have any grants. We... Um, it was, it's just been incredibly grassroots. Our friends and families, like my, my two little nephews who are two and a half and five are saving their allowance and giving it to the film. And um, It's been a wonderful thing. It's, it's, <laughs> that certainly hasn't gotten the film made, but <laughs> it helped. Now I have an agent announcement. I am a peace broker and the International Rescue Committee together with the International Medical Corps would like to announce a kind of performance that will be at La Bouge Camp this afternoon. Yes, the performers are used who have worked with IRC, stroke IMC, and we 
authorities of Uganda to bring you this very special drama. We hope to see you there. All right, that's the very, very special announcement. Let's go on with the last music. who was the Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs, um, said that the crisis in northern Uganda is the greatest forgotten, neglected humanitarian crisis in the world today. And our goal was that it remained forgotten and neglected no longer, and we felt the best way was through media. And I think a story artfully told um, can move mountains and can affect people more than uh, anything that I've seen so far in my experience. Um, and when I came back, I knew that I couldn't bring all the people in northern Uganda back here to tell their stories. But, and I couldn't bring all my friends and family over to northern Uganda to, to have the experience that I had. But in a way, we could bring their voices back. I mean, you know, a lot of people were saying, you know, you've given them a voice. And it's like, no, they have a voice. We're just giving them a platform so that it can be shared with the world. And I also think that people are incredibly generous and want to take action. And um, it's very important at every event to have an option for people to take an action right there in the moment. Um, we usually hand out letters for people to sign, give out websites, and I'm going to give you one right now if you'd like it. Um, it's resolveuganda.org, and you can sign a letter to our senators and our congresspeople. And, um, you know, those things have made such a difference, and we've seen it, and there's been a lot of movement. Um, and I don't know, does anyone have any questions? Brian? <laughs> oh, I, I mean, <clears throat> obviously, like, uh, the, the the imagery just, I mean, I've, and I, I've, I've known Melissa for a little bit, and we've, I've seen some of the uh, other stuff that, that she's done. Um, and, you know, Mel Melissa wanted to use this, you know, a medium to tell a story. And I think a lot of people here in the panel We'll be able to even as we as we move on, and we'll uh, and we get into some questions and talk a little bit more about it. How Melissa's the, these images and these stories can be told, and how people can actually then hear <clears throat> and see, and then to act from those stories itself. Because the internet's one version, <clears throat> film is another another way in 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 a in a, in a theater environment, television. Um, but as but as things go to mobile, as 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 people are able to make and react much quicker, how do we actually take, you know, how, how like, that, that specific call to action, Melissa, that you're, that you're looking for, um, you know, how we can actually hone that so people, when they see that, can they immediately respond to it? So I think that that's, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be compelling as, as this comes out. When is it supposed to come out, by the way? We don't know. We're almost finished it. We, we did partner with International Rescue Committee and International Medical Corps also, you know, so that we could get the messaging right and that we didn't, put any of the children we worked with in danger. So we're having a screening for them in New York in June. So hopefully soon after that, we'll be shopping it around, doing festivals and stuff. OK. Um, wonderful. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Charles? Do you think we can see the immigration? I was doing that immigration film. Do you, do you want to play it before we do explore? Because I know it downloaded the one that you were doing. Sure. Yeah, you want to do it for it? I was going to come back to it at the end. Oh, I didn't. I was just watching it. Okay. Um, yes, sure. If you want to, let's do that. Okay. I just noticed it. I like watching these films. They're so interesting. <laughs> Que 
Just very briefly, you know, our idea with that particular clip was to just try to do one thing, which was to really, you know, for it to be a reframing tool, for it to take this idea of immigrants who are here in the United States today working in sort of the low wage sector, where frequently, you know, um, there can be stereotypes. Um, there is anger or hatred sometimes. And to say, can we use this scene, these two scenes, to connect those stories to the stories of Ellis Island, to the stories of the immigrants that we think of coming to New York City, working hard. And when you see Lupe doing the same job that a Jewish or a Polish immigrant might have done early in the 20th century, you know, that makes a connection. So this was both encapsulating that message within the video and then the video having a call to do a screening and it serving both functions. And that worked really effectively for reaching out to a lot of bloggers you know, in this sector and then posting this and you know, end up leading to screenings. <laughs> I was so excited. He uh, went into his room and, and started uh, working on this. But, um, you know, it's interesting hearing people speak. To me, explore in a nutshell is what I almost call Sesame Street for adults. It's making learning fun again. It's opening your eyes to the world and showing the connective tissue we all share. It's replacing fear with trust. So we have a little bit different angle. I think really explore began just because we live in such a sound bite culture and the information we get just isn't accurate. Uh, look at the media today. Look at Africa. It's portrayed as the world's great pity party. You have AIDS, famine, war, and a few cute animals sprinkled on top. Oh, let's switch over to China. World's great superpower. They're evil. But actually, it's not true. Switch over to the Middle East and we have this Islamic phobia. Very few people really understand the soul of these cultures, nor do they take the time. And so Explore is really an introduction. It's, uh, our tagline is never stop learning. And the real hope is we can show the connective tissue that we share on a global level, both domestically and abroad. We do projects here in America and abroad. And so this trailer that my editor, which I don't haven't seen yet, so I'm curious, is a taste of kind of the global picture of Explore.
Explore is a unique multimedia project that documents the great works of the inspirational leaders of the nonprofit world. This is both debating, this is where they practice all their philosophy, this is where they practice scripture. Through on site visits to places like Darfur, India, Hawaii, and the Arctic, Explore encourages people to discover the beauty of selflessness. Explore's multimedia library consists of over 250 short documentary films, world-class photographic galleries, and original interviews with inspirational NGO leaders and local heroes. Somebody has to work with the kids, and somebody has to do prevention and keep kids from joining gangs and engage them, and somehow keep them connected to loving, caring adults who pay attention. Yo, yo quiero, yo voy a dedicar mi vida a la conservación. Y creo que tener todos estos conocimientos de base me ayuda muchísimo a poder, a, a poder conectarnos con las personas. All you have to do is look at the features of other rural and you see an awful lot of, of human characteristics. Genetically, we're 98.67%, the same as most great apes. Explore is a brand new concept that combines philanthropy, travel, and learning. Led by Charles Annenberg Weingarten with support from the Annenberg Foundation, the Explore team embarks on fact-finding missions to identify potential grant recipients and document the great works of non-profit organizations through films and photography. How has music kind of shaped your life? Well, music has been like, that's the first thing I fell in love with. What's the key to living a happy life? Push it up. Huh? Then you can push it, push it. To learn more, please visit us at explore.org. That's great. I don't have a clip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned earlier I have a couple of startups that I can't really talk about. That's not because they're like stealth. It's just because they don't exist yet, and I'm not, I'm not a douchebag that hands out stickers for sites that don't exist yet. Um, <laughs> One of them, though, is called WeSumer.com. Uh, if you want to sign up, we, uh, are, we're sort of um, planning something where you can track your consumption. So uh, this is, I, I came from this space. I did the media thing for a really long time. Um, I, and then I got more interested in the, the new media, the social media, the tech side of things. Um, but it still seemed like working in Hollywood, even the new media was still an extension of old media, which is like, how can we use these new tools to spread our message even further? And I just, I wasn't interested in marketing. I was more interested in solving problems for people directly. Like, I think this all has really great value. I was just more interested in like the on the ground problem solving. So, so I kind of left that space and decided I was more interested in software as a service. So anyway, I'm still in the sustainability space. It's all, you know, uh, environmental based. Um, and one is called WeSumer, if you're interested in tracking your consumption, sort of like a dieting site for consumption. Um, we're building that right now. The other one, I actually don't have a name yet, so I really can't talk about it, <laughs> sadly. But, um, but I'm interested in what you guys were talking about. I mean, particularly Melissa, like you have such a holistic approach, you know, building in the activism at the outset. I mean, that was, you know, we learned that at participant as we went. We didn't know that in the beginning, but we learned that as we went that that was really the way to do it if the goal was in the end to, you know, to enable activism. I mean, that's what I'm interested in is like where people, I mean, I, I'm sign up, sort of a populist. I want to know how the people can get involved instead of just like more platforms for celebrities to tell us what they think. I don't care. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, and that's what I would like to talk about on the, you know, in our little brief discussion. I don't know what, what you guys are interested in, but. 
No, well, that's what we're going to do. I mean, that's yeah. what we're going to we're going to we're we're going to discuss obviously what we've seen and obviously why why each individually you you guys have chosen to do what you've done and what your goals are, um, and in terms of how we can actually utilize not just when you talk about social media and just the internet, but but really about that action that that you talk about making because it is because again it is it's like there's so many sites even you know with, with Coscast like I, you know I. I I run into, you know, everyone has media, everyone has content, everyone has a, you know, a voice and, and everyone wants to in, inspire people. But at the same time, they have a very, sometimes they either don't, they're not either, they're not doing it correctly or they, or they're, they're not using the tools properly and they're not able to, to really connect with the people that they, they were trying to connect with. So, um, and I'd like to go to, um, real quickly down the, uh, the line with, uh, with, um, Melissa, when you when when the, when the film actually eventually comes out, like how do you how do you envision um, you know people really starting to give back to to your not to your nonprofit organization? Because I don't know if you didn't talk about that though. You're, that you do have a nonprofit. That, yeah, we so. we do have a nonprofit um, which is called Voices in Harmony, which we started in, actually in 1995. We work with at-risk teens on a mentoring theater program here in Los Angeles, and we have professional writers, actors, and directors work with teens to write short plays based on their own personal stories and the theme. Um, and uh, that was the umbrella organization. Voices of Uganda is a project of Voices in Harmony, right. Um, right. but. I mean, I think that um, Voices in Harmony isn't going to be the implementer of the entire advocacy campaign. We really do want to partner with existing groups already. And, um, you know, we're, we've worked very hard to um, raise money to allow the teens that we worked with um, in 2007 on the theater program to be able to continue to do that. And we're doing that through the International Rescue Committee, which mm -hmm. is also one of the reasons that we partnered with them because they're already there on the ground. They were there before we got there, and they were going to be there long after we left. And we wanted to have some continuity for, for the youth that were there. Um, but in terms of getting young people involved, I mean, it, and, and general people involved, like already we've done things through um, World Affairs Council. Uh, we did the Freedom Awards for International Rescue Committee. We've done things through International Medical Corps, through high schools, through colleges and universities. Um, you know, at the University of San Diego, at the Institute of Peace. We've just been doing those kinds mm -hmm. of events and then asking people, like developing projects in the schools where students can, um, through their English department, write letters based on their experience after seeing some video. We work with them on the monologues and the plays that our teens in Uganda wrote so that they're working on those here in the United States as well so they really learn about the issue. And then they write um, a letter to their congressperson, and then there's a lobbying event in June mm -hmm. in D.C. So your, goal, so your goal is really getting people to, to write, to not just donate to, yeah. but just, just to inspire people in, in their, for the representatives to take action? Absolutely. Well, okay. we've got to end the war. There's also uh, Joseph Kony, who's the rebel army leader, is um, still abducting children. Now he's moved to the Congo. Um, so he's got to be um, captured. There's an indictment out for his arrest by the International Criminal Courts. Right. And the United States was pretty much not involved in the peace process until very recently. And that is because citizens in the United States stood up and said, we need to be involved in this peace process. And I've seen huge movement in the past three years. There's been a ceasefire, and I, I think I think the war is close to being over, hopefully. Yeah. But then the other thing we want is for... United States and for Americans to stay involved because there's been a war there for 23 years because of neglect and people have been forced into into camps so they haven't been living in their villages there's a lot to be done to rebuild those because what are these children going home to right Charles um, in terms of where sorry is that, <laughs> I'm like Charles, they get a laughter from there um, with what's uh, with all the experiences that you've had and your team has had with Explore, can you talk a little bit more about what your uh, future goals are in terms of how when you continue to tell these stories and showing people more so in, in uh, whether it be in schools or online or in any way that you guys are going to to be able to, to touch people? How um, do you foresee um, media playing a part in those continuous stories where people can actually continue to? Uh, uh, 
not only learn but also to feel connected to uh, a lot of these people that you met because I'm, I'm looking at these videos and I've, I've, I'm very familiar with what you guys are doing and, and I feel very connected to the personal stories with what you're doing, these people that you've met along the way that I feel like I've kind of just developed a little relationship with and that I wouldn't be able to have that by just watching sometimes like a three minute yeah. clip about something. So I think what you guys are doing is very unique. So can you talk a little bit more about those? Well, uh, you know, when Explore started as a, I guess, a multimedia platform, one of our goals was, I think, to have more of an expansive website. But, you know, whereas you guys at Coscast do such a good job, I, I'm just proud to have something up. <laughs> it's been a real struggle. Um, Media is an interesting tool, and it's changed so much. A picture's a thousand words. You know, truthfully, when you talk about impact in media, I don't think, is it effective yet? I, I don't know the answer, and I'll say that honestly. Uh, people watch film, but they usually walk away. I mean, ha does it have an everlasting, true impact? That's to be determined. Um, I kind of think of myself as a breadcrumb layer, making introductions, and we're currently on uh, Link TV. We're on 400 different public broadcasting channels and growing. Uh, the internet, we have certain partners. Obviously, mobile will be a platform. We do a lot of uh, special events, Brian, where in different cities that are showcasing Explore content where we invite from children to anyone on that level. I turn into a lot of schools, which is my favorite place. They call me Professor Charlie, and uh, I always say that's the hardest audience and the best audience because, you know, children really just get it, and you can't put a facade in front of them. So the distribution, which I'm sure all filmmakers can relate to, is a really tricky thing that even Explore here is trying to navigate. One of the things that we, besides media, film, um, we have a very, I actually think our photographic library is stronger than our media because the difference between a picture and a film, I always say, is you'll watch a film once, but a photograph you'll look at in perpetuity. And so I like to blend the whole multimedia approach. Um, I'd like to leave one thing, though, the connection you have with the minds. The, the goal of Explore and what we're working on right now was I kind of think of us as almost a, a network itself, a CNN, per se, of sort. And what I mean by that is we've met so many minds around the planet. And one of the next phases is that they're all going to be um, blogging on our site, talking about issues, issues that you can ask them questions, create that personal relationship, um, but right from an authentic place in their heart, a, a trusted place, not one that's sensationalized. So hopefully the story will unfold. We just haven't gotten to that place uh, technologically or uh, skillfully yet. That was, you know, so right now I'm happy you're enjoying them on an emotional level. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we're, we're, are we on time? we're okay. Um, eventually I'm going to get to the to qu uh, questions for everybody, but um, is uh, Mark... Just in terms of, you know, obviously the way you uh, declare yourself as a, as a approach things, can you just talk about um, actually, uh, or actually even, even comment how declare yourself, being because it's political, and it's not so much about like either, you know, for people, um, you know, uh, like sort of like being involved in, the, in that conversation where it's like there's this major issue because voting is, is something that is, that, that, that people have such a problem even being able to register to vote to navigate those waters. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, we're a 501c3, so we're fully nonpartisan. The key to us is that you vote and that you vote as an informed voter. You've thought about it, you've researched mm -hmm. it, you're well informed. So um, where do we go from there? It, it's, um, you know, it, it's a challenge because you want to give people voice, but you don't want to tell them what position to take. And it's a fine line that we have to walk mm -hmm. to, uh, to actually accomplish that. Uh, we hope that we can give people voice in 2009 and 2010 in influencing the next congressional elections. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
there's a huge gap there between what goes on in the community and what goes on inside the Beltway, and where the executive branch has done a much, a, a fairly good job spitting off of the campaign and building a lot of interactivity. Uh, the legislative branch has not yet done that, and we right. hope to help them do that. Okay. Well, I'm, we didn't really get to talk much um, about you know what we, what we saw from you. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're, you know, in terms of the interactivity from these tools that people in the area are able to get involved with and to continue those conversations, not unlike what, with what Charles is doing with Explore, and how people around along the river are going to be able to continue the story. And as it, it keeps expanding, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, the, the one thing that I, I mean, I, I think that every person in this panel sort of is issue based. You know, every single project you, you know, deals with the war in Uganda, immigration. And, uh, and it's funny that I'm, uh, and I don't mean to spoil the party, but I'm the only real person of color in this panel. And What are you talking about? <laughs> you are? Yeah. Okay. I'm half, I'm half Jewish. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, but but the, the, the interesting thing is that the, the, that was funny. <laughs> You're speechless. He's speechless. <laughs> he did. Uh, so, but, but the interesting thing is that uh, when we did departures, one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, go to neighborhoods that are ethnic in LA, uh -huh. um, Boyle Heights, Central Avenue, uh, even Eagle Rock with a lot of Filipino communities, and don't make an issue out of them simply have the patience to explore it the way that it is without politicizing it beyond, um, you know, beyond our nose. And, and I think that that has allowed a different kind of experience sort of to emerge out of this project. And um, it's not a, a, an experience that, that necessarily is gonna push you to some sort of political action of some sort, uh, but it's some sort of, um, uh, by the community getting together to help in the production of it, in the development of it, you're sort of pre creating some sort of uh, uh, community activity uh, that is bringing the community together, uh, not to necessarily uh, go over these political issues, but just to be together, which they don't get to do very often sometimes. Um, that said, uh, when you Trans try to translate uh, that offline experience, sort of community gathering, producing, developing content to an online world, uh, it's very difficult. And I think that, you know, I mean, we were having a conversation about this before. How can you translate that sort of nearness uh, to an online experience? Uh, and what we have tried to do with the new uh, platform that we're going to launch uh, uh, with our uh, the partners, Viewbox, is uh, provide a library of assets that are produced mm -hmm. by the community that uh, become sort of a repository of stories about that neighborhood, and people can do whatever they want with it. Yeah. And hopefully that um, experience is going to create uh, the same offline sort of uh, um, energy that occur when things are produced. Okay. And we're doing Venice uh, next after the LA River and then we're actually trying to do one in the San Gabriel Valley which is the new Chinatown uh, for those who don't know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, try to uh, do something similar about immigration where there's a lot of immigrants from uh, uh, inland China what is the relationship between that geography and the geography in LA and try to meld it together into one of these things mm -hmm. without making it an issue, but actually an experience. Awesome. Um, all right, so we're running out of time, but I wanted to uh, thank everybody here, but I wanted to, um, before I do, before we say goodbye, I wanted to open up to questions. Anyone in the audience has anything for anybody up here?
wonderful. Yeah, and then your project, worldsavvy.org, have you heard of them? We haven't heard of them. Because they're doing a whole education curriculum even on immigration. Oh, that's great. starting a new organization called META, Media, Entertainment, Technology, and Arts. It's about bringing all the people who are trying to use media, entertainment, technology, and arts for transformation, for bettering the planet, together in, in, a, in a dialogue, in a support system for all the people who are trying to uh, change the planet that way. Uh, we're going to be starting to launch in June, so if anybody wants is, uh, wanting to keep uh, posted on that, I'd be happy to uh, keep you all informed. The whole idea is that we can get the information out about all these great projects because there's so much that is going on, so many people doing such great work, even here in the audience. So how do we actually really spread that word? Yeah, I think, and that's a good point. I mean, that everyone is, you know, when everyone has like, you know, individually, you know, when you talk about media, a lot of people have their own sites and a lot of people have other sites. But when we're, we're talking about this type of content in terms of trying to get not only the word out, but getting people to, to, <coughs> to interact, it's very important that we have like what I call radical collaboration, yes. where everybody works with everybody, exactly. because when it happens, then you really start to get people on, like, oh, I can't get it, like, I'm, you're seeing all this stuff, well, it's like, you can't, you know, there's no real ownership in the, in the real estate, it's like, you have to let people have the ability to see and interact with all of it, and that's how the, the model, especially online, is changing, is because it's really content is meant to be free, and that people need to see it, and people need to interact with it, through all across all platforms. You know, so the old that old model of ownership is sort of starting to you know die down, and people just sort of like allowing it to live and exist in everywhere, whether it be like MySpace, Facebook, those are the, the social networks, and then there's going to be other networks that are across the board. And if we're talking about this type of content living everywhere and actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, then it's driving that to the action, and that's really going to where we're you know pretty much we're all here because it's basically the content being driving to the action immediately because there is a lot of noise out there. There is a lot of, you know, uh, distraction. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, yes. Um, I was wondering whether I mean, it seems like most of the panel sort of uh, approaches this from a nonprofit kind of perspective. Um, is there any movement or are there any business models that you have seen that can promote the kind of causes that are working on, but from a from a sustainable business? Well, actually, we are supported a lot by uh, corporations, and uh, there is it, it's a it's a very sustainable model. It's finding mutuality, finding mutual interest, and sometimes you can't, and but quite a lot of the times you can, and maybe it's easier for us because voting is like apple pie. What you know, as long as you're not partisan, who could be against voting, right? So it's a little easier for us, but I think there are ways to do that with the right partners without selling your soul and compromising your mission, just the opposite. I was going to say, you should sell your URL. You could probably fund your, uh, your, your <laughs> enterprise there for a couple of years with that 1995 URL. So we're all facing funding issues in one, and we can't write corporations off the list. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you're also going to see, you know, as, as uh, different, you know, as uh, traditional media starts to wanting to uh, support this type of in this type of content, you're going to look at people being more involved, and, and whether it's corporations, whether that's with grants, whether that's going to be the public supporting it because they feel it's important, whether it's like an NPR, or PBS, and we 
because those, those and those and those platforms are, are under you know they're under duress, not only from the funding that's going to be you know from the government that might you know be hurt, but also from the public that's not that needs to find you know do a better it needs to do a better job of trying to get uh, you know get funding. But so yeah, I think you're going to see an evolution of those business models. And you know, I think anything on the internet has been told that one business model that they, they start with never turns out the way that they planned. And you know, even existing me mega platforms have a hard time monetizing what they're doing without without showing the user experience. So I think we're still in a very you know unique state. And there are like uh, a couple of interesting experiments, spot us. I don't know if you're familiar with that and real changes. I don't know if they're really have become successful, but there's sort of an interesting way that they're approaching collective funding for projects like this. Can you name those again? Real Changes um, and Spot.us. And again, I don't know how successful they are, but they're like good sort of case studies as, you know, to raise money collectively for uh, an idea. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I am uh, Jim Crotty, and I'm uh, producing a, uh, a documentary uh, TV series uh, called Resolve. Uh, it's at resolve.tv, and it's kind of the great debaters of uh, today. It's about urban debate in the South Bronx. And uh, I am facing funding issues myself, and um, I, I think that from all of you, I feel like I might have something to offer, so I'd love to talk to you all about this, because I feel like debate, kids learning critical thinking skills, being able to articulate uh, through debate, policy debate, um, is something that cuts across all these issues, because we debate immigration, we debate Uganda, we debate you know, pr practically every issue that's been discussed. Um, and my biggest issue is, you know, again, the funding question. Um, I've tried to go through certain foundations, they don't fund media, they support the cause, but there's no money. So I just have a big, again, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about corporations, but I can see why they would support Declare Yourself, but, and mine is pretty nonpartisan as well. At the same time, it's just close but no cigar so many times. So again, a big question about funding because the project really, I mean, I put my own money into it, and people say, as a producer, you really shouldn't do that. And so, at the end of the day, the, the work is not continuing because of lack of funding, which is really sad. The, the, I think that the interesting thing um, that Robert had with these little clips, I think, was that the film was not used as an end on itself, but as a, uh, a single platform um, to engage different communities uh, in like little chunks. Right, um, which I think could be an interesting model. And, and on the funding and business side, I mean, a couple of things to mention. Over the last two years, I mean, the work that we've been doing has been funded maybe 60% or so by sort of earned income and earned revenue, and maybe 40% by grants and foundation funding. And all of the foundation kind of funding, I mean, some of that is about long relationships and being at the right conferences and really building and thinking about you know, what someone's needs are and what, how your work intersects with that. But also going back to sort of the, um, the business model side of it, part of what we did was think about who's going to want to screen this film. And when you think about church groups or grassroots community groups, well, it's unlikely that they have funding. So they're not going to want to pay a whole lot in order to show Made in LA. Um, but then you think about they actually have a need to raise funds. So one of the things that we did, and this is one of several different models that we offer, but was a screening kit where you get a couple of posters and you get, uh, in the case of one screening kit, which um, has a price point that's $99, but then you get 10 DVDs. So in that kit, if you sell five of those DVDs at the screening, it covers the cost of the kit. If you sell another five, you actually could raise another hundred dollars. That could cover the cost of the food at the event, let's say. And that's a model where, you know, a hundred postcards go out with that kit, so our message is continuing to everyone who's there at that event. To the organizers, it ends up being free. They actually end up making something from it. And it's sort of a very um, sort of
of a very friendly exchange that happens there. Now, especially in this economic climate, that, that model doesn't work for everyone. But that's something that we have looked at, thinking not just about our needs, but what are the needs of the people who are doing the organizing who might be able to show a film like this. And some of that thinking is part of what's enabled us to sort of keep going. Mickey. Mickey. I feel like I feel like I, we've uh, we've neglected you on the side of the table, so I wanted to hear you chime in from you know in terms of this question, um, what you thought potentially. Yeah, in terms, in terms of that question in particular, it's obviously the age old question comes up at every conference, but it's like it's the same as with the music industry and any other in industry. Like if you think about um, the product you're making, not as like something that you're selling. I mean, it's like what Brian you were just talking about is you know the ownership of media is going away, so you have to think of the tertiary things like. What else can you make money on? Um, as far as getting money from from foundations and and that sort of thing, I, I wonder if Melissa's approach makes more sense, where the film is just part of a larger package of mm. a campaign that is addressing a particular issue. I mean, if you're making a cause film, you know, it's probably coming from your interest in the cause, not just from your ego as a filmmaker. So I would think you could like package it as a bigger project and say, you know, this film is part of this larger mission that I have, and as, as a part of that mission, we've created this campaign, and this campaign includes this website, this film, you know, this nonprofit partner, this, you know, this broader package, and it seems to me like that might be more fundable than just a movie, because like everyone wants to make a movie. Yeah, and, and I think to, to that extent too, people want ownership to be involved, they wanna, they wanna, they wanna feel like they're a part of something, so I think if you actually involve them in the process and actually they, you give them that ownership and you give them the ability to take be a, a part of the entire, of this like, uh, of whether it was Melissa's movie, for example, from start to finish and there is a form of ownership and then all of a sudden the public is now involved in helping you create what that is because if the end result is not about making money but it's actually having some sort of action, which is what we're talking, pretty much primarily the core of what we're talking about here. I think that's really another model that's going to stand up. And we've seen that with uh, Barack Obama. Everyone's talking about the Obama model. Everyone's small donations that, that basically got a president in the off, into office. And everyone's <coughs> talking, about, well, I'm going to create the Obama model. Well, you can't create the Obama model unless you don't. You have you need Obama. <laughs> you know, actually, and, and, actually, can I say something about yeah. the Obama model? Yeah. It's actually a really, really, really interesting case. Like, it, unfortunately, the site's not up anymore. But my Barack Obama. You know where everyone could get involved and hold screenings and do the kinds of things that we're talking about. One of the reasons it was successful is because they brought in people who knew what they were doing in the online community, and they gave visitors a range of activities. So if you wanted, you could show up and you could donate five bucks, and you could be done, and you could never come back again. But if you were really, really engaged and you really cared about Barack Obama, you could find the tools you needed to host host an event at your house. You could come up with your own ideas and share them. Like they provided the platform, it's a platform, to, for people to engage a, a, in, a, in a whole range of ways. And that is like community management 101. Mm -hmm. And it's like something that we can all learn from if you're building websites around your projects, is to allow for that range of activity. Because if you let leaders emerge, it's like you know, you're not doing the work anymore. And all of a sudden you have, other, it's, you know, it was a real grassroots organization through new tools and technology. I mean, they just, they use new tools to support age-old activities. They're not trying to, you know, shove in new activities. Like, you're not going to change how people are. You're just going to enable them somehow. So, I don't know. It's a great right. example. And, and, and getting to that point, everyone felt that they owned a part of Rock. Totally. Rock. They felt a part. That was, the, that was the je ne sais quoi. That was that special sauce where they were actually, I feel a part of this campaign. I helped uh, and be a part of this whole thing. And that, that's sort of, you know, the, the part of, I think, back to your question about debating, I think if people were to feel more, you know, inclined and, and sort of involved in the process and, and actually, you know, really created that sort of niche space and tools that you'd be able to, you know, you might be able to get the public to be more involved in it, schools to be able to, because if you provide tools for people, I think then then you can, you can talk about that. Um, to the, the panelists, did any, any panelists have any, any questions for other panelists? Because I know we didn't really get a chance to, I wish we had a chance to have more interaction. It was like more of a table and we can kind of talk because I think we can go for a couple hours. But does anyone have any questions for each other? Here, anybody? Did anybody have questions? I, I didn't see any more hands. I just want to know, oh. did anyone leave a clerk? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
anybody has any questions or any more questions or any panelists have a question for each other. Uh,